Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 82, Off House, discussing house rules in tabletop games. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we are talking house rules during the Ask the Bellhop segment. Uh, we've got something new for this week, and this is probably going to continue for the coming weeks. We've got two games in our review segment. Up first, I got Gold West from TMG, and that's going to be followed by Carpe Diem, a, I shouldn't say new, but hot new to me, Steffenfeld game. Then in our weekly look back at what we played, I've got some more Gold West and Carpe Diem, as well as Istanbul, and a couple two-player games that Deanna and I got to play well out of town, which will include Jombo and Seven Wonders Duel, and probably the oldest game we've ever played together. And finally, we'll be announcing our winners of Medium after the coffee break. Yes, we're actually going to draw the winners during the coffee break, so you'll get to... Those, those of you who join us for the coffee break will not get to see it live, but get to see the... Uh, we're not going to do it live so that we don't send out someone's email address accidentally like we did last time. But Deanna is going to pull, pull the winners live. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folks. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Today's comments come from all over the place, older articles, podcasts, and more. Up first, Emmett O'Brien has a comment from our Clans of Caledonia unboxing video. That was a rough period in Scottish history. Okay, when wasn't it a rough period in <laughs> Scottish history? This game looks like a good candidate for the O'Brien rule, Winner Cleans Up. All right, thanks for the comment, Emmett. Uh, winner Cleans Up, eh? I kind of like it. I, I could see you using that one. Though I'd be more tempted to be evil and make it Loser Cleans Up, just because they encourage people. I don't want someone to throw the game because there's too many components. And I got to say... Clans of Caledonia might be one of them. This this game might benefit from that rule. There are a lot of little bits in Clans of Caledonia. Some of the most wood I've ever seen in a board game. Well, Chuck D has a comment on our putting the F in FLGS article. I think more than anything, it's the staff. Selection comes second, and overall environment and setup of the store third. A place to play is nice, but it's not high on my list. Well, thanks for the comment, Chuck. And I totally agree that the staff can make or break a store. I don't know how many times I've walked in and quickly out of a store without buying anything just due to the attitude or lack of knowledge of the staff. Uh, this mostly happens out of town. So most of Windsor stores have got nice, friendly staff. Now, personally, I prefer environment to stock status because stock status, to be honest, nowadays, they, as long as the store is willing and able to order stuff in, I'm usually pretty good. I'm not much of an impulse buyer myself. I tend to do research ahead of time. But what I want is an inviting place to actually play games, to shop, to try before I buy, more than be able to get what I, a game right then and now. I, as usual, we're not all about the new hotness. All right, well, Patrick, at TM Gillespie 68 on Twitter, has some podcast feedback for us. Hi, Mo. I'm a big fan of your podcast and your tweets. You always mention that you're open to criticism, so I have a quick comment. I listen to a lot of gaming podca podcasts because I like to hear about games played, new releases, and news in the community. I tend to pretty much skip half of your show because you <laughs> spend the first 30 minutes plus answering listener questions, repeating the same information about how to contact you, and bouncing back and forth to the people watching live. I usually look at how long your show is, divide time in half, and <laughs> that's about where I start. At that point, you're usually done with answering questions. Again, I like your show, but mostly the second half. All right, fair enough. Thanks for the comment, Patrick. Um, I'd noted before, if we like to bring up and talk about negative feedback as well as positive. Uh, this one I, I find interesting, almost fascinating, because this is the first time we've heard this, that the, the, the second half is better than the first half. Usually it's the other half, 
that people tune out. They listen to the first half. They love the questions. They love the interaction. And then they don't necessarily follow through to the end of the show to hear like what we played in the last week. Now, on one hand, I think it's probably a good thing to know that we have people who like both halves. And you know what? I don't really have a problem with that. And some people have a strong preference for one over the other. And that's cool, too, because, well, at least they're listening. On the other hand, I'm a bit sad that anyone isn't a fan of the first half, because that, to me, is like the whole point, right? That's the whole tabletop bellhop thing. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. We're not just another news and reviews podcast. We're not about the new hotness, but we are all about answering your questions. To me, that's kind of the entire point of this whole thing. And the Ask the Bellhop segment is our bread and butter. So unless we get a ton of feedback like Patrick's telling us that people don't actually want to hear our game night advice, we're probably going to keep the overall format the same. Now, I do think maybe we do need to look at how often we say contest us at tabletopbellhop.com or send questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. But we do hear you got to hear things, seven things for them to stick in your head. So I kind of like saying it as often as I can because that's really where we want. And, well, if you don't want to listen to the questions, obviously you don't want to hear how to send them in. But overall, I am glad Patrick found something to like about the show and as a listener. I appreciate it. I appreciate every listener we have. Enjoying half the show is better than not enjoying it at all. And we do thank you for turning in. Now, one thing we've looked at is the adding of chapter marks in the podcast so that if you mm. do want to skip around, you're more able to. Now, unfortunately, while there are podcasts that do it and there is some software to support that, it's mostly an Apple thing. And as Windows people, it would be an additional cost for us to be able to provide that. What I can say, though, is that on our YouTube version, we do have jump links in the description. Mm -hmm. so you can get to the different sections quickly in that format. Also on YouTube, we do break up the show. So if all you want is the review section, you can watch just the review section. What we don't have, though, is we don't have our... Uh, our uh, we can review. Tabletop. Yeah. yeah, which actually, if people want, we can bring back. We were putting those on YouTube. But, but we basically well stopped <laughs> because no one was watching them. Yep. Plus, you can't really SEO that. How do, I, how do I make a YouTube title for I played 17 games this weekend? Like, that... Like, if, it, if I just focus on one game, it works, but that's basically a review segment. So that's why we dropped that out of the YouTube. All right, well, now here's a cool one. We got a comment on our Gorus Maximus review from Connor McGooey, the designer of the game. Family friendly, eh? Then keep your eyes on our social media on March 22nd, World Water Day. Time to give back. All right. I used to give all the gladiators a bath on World Water Day. I don't know. I got to say, I do love it when publishers and designers take the time to actually check out our reviews and even better when they take the time to comment. So thanks just for that, Connor, for, you know, keeping up, paying attention to the news that's out there about your games. Now, I don't know if Connor is hinting at a new version of Goris with more accessible artwork or something totally new, but I am looking forward to seeing what he's got to offer later this month. Next, we've got some game recommendations from a fan who replied to our best licensed game article. Tim writes, two other excellent licensed games I would recommend are Doctor Who, Time of the Daleks, and Power Rangers, Heroes of the Grid. Oh, thanks for the recommendations, Tim. I will be sure to toss those in the show notes. So for those of you listening to the podcast and want to check out those games, there should be a link there. Now, that Doctor Who game, I know well. That game has been on sale for a long time. I share it all the time at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. It's been 35% off, at least since Black Friday, if not before. But I know pretty much nothing else about the game, but I did see today, after sharing that deal, someone pointed out there's a revised edition coming soon. So if anyone is looking to pick that up, it sounds like it might be worth waiting a little bit. Now, I don't know what they've changed. Now, as for Power Rangers, that game caught my eye. For one, I love Renegade Games, and they do a great job on developing and producing their games. So no matter what, I expect it to be good because it's Renegade, and, like, the miniatures and stuff look cool. But for me, it's a try before you buy, because for one, I'm a little too old to have any nostalgia towards Power Rangers. That wasn't my thing. Yeah, something I might want to take a look at with that Doctor Who game, as the kids and I are real Whovians, though it seems like I'll probably want to wait for the update if it's on its way. Uh, sadly, no one here, kids or I, have ever really felt like, uh, you know, Power Rangers fans. So, Yeah, we watched a bit of it. One of our friends, Mike Barker, was a huge fan. So it was one of those, if Mike was around, we tended to watch it. And, I, you know, I watched a few shows when we had syndicated TV and there was nothing better on. So, <laughs> like, I'm at least familiar with the with the, the um, license in the, yeah. in the world. So I kind of get it. I'd like, I kind of want to see a game that does the scale change. 
Because right. that was the big thing in Power Rangers, same thing in Voltron. Yeah. They fight on foot for a while until they start getting beat up, and then the giant monster comes, and then they form Megazord or whatever, and they beat it up. And I'd like to see how that's done in a game. Like, I just I mechanically want to know what that transition is and how it works. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and then the the toys that made us did a Power Rangers episode, didn't they? Yeah, I haven't watched that one because, yeah. again, it was eh, it's Power Rangers. <laughs> I didn't collect the toys for sure. I have so. to say, that show, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, Netflix yes. has a a series called The Toys That Made Us. Mm -hmm. Highly recommended for anyone who is, you know, our age or in, in especially you know, 30, 30 up, I guess, would probably be the range because it really touches a lot of the toys of our childhood and gives backstory that are completely uh, new to me on, on a lot of different uh, toy lines. No, I agree. Fantastic show. Well, well worth watching. Yeah. They'll, they'll just watch out for the chair in the Barbie episode because that <laughs> thing might kill you in your sleep. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we're gonna finish up. Nightmares. <laughs> we're gonna finish up with a couple of Gloomhaven comments from our YouTube channel. Jacob Jakimak, Jakimiak commented on our echo chamber actual play to say, "Funny at one forty three twenty nine, you guys are talking that you've been playing for one and a half years and sometimes still make mistakes. And then one of you uses Pendant of Dark Pacts to retrieve utility cloak, while the pendant allows to recover consumed minor items only." Mm -hmm. I like that scenario. We've passed it yesterday at level two, uh, level very hard, plus two, with the S team, Toothslinger, Stun, and Scoundrel. <laughs> two of us ended up exhausted, but luckily not all monsters needed to be killed. The main struggle was clearing two first rooms, then quick rush to open remaining doors ASAP before exhaustion. Toothslinger, Stun, and Scoundrel. We still haven't played two of those classes, so we don't have that group. You're obviously playing a three-player. I'm impressed by anyone who can play on very hard. Now, that may be a three-player thing. We do hear the fourth player is better. But you know what? Uh, this is unfortunately not the last time Deanna is going to use pendant, the pendant that way. Uh, on our video that goes live tomorrow, you'll get to see another example of it. I'm sure it's one of those cases where you knew it at first. Like, you read the item, and you're like, yeah, yeah, it's minor items. And then after multiple games, you kind of forget and start thinking, yeah, it's all items, not just small items. Um, also, I'm guessing Temujin, our guy in the chair doesn't know that card because man he catches us almost every time and he missed this one like multiple times he's missed this one so i'm, I'm just guessing he probably hasn't unlocked the pendant of dark pact so there's there's one to keep informed uh that's another one where i, I want to go in and edit our faq and add in a note somehow but no one was able to get back to us until we have subscriber status again thousand subscribers on youtube head over there hit subscribe whoever you are we appreciate it we'll let us add annotation to our videos and then maybe we can put something in but you know what Thanks for pointing it out. We say it every time we go live playing Gloomhaven. Please, please correct our mistakes. Uh, the 45 page rule book, lots and lots of interactions, individual cards, items, special abilities, symbols, icons. We're going to make mistakes, and we still do after, like I said, almost two years. So thank you for pointing it out. And at this point, you probably won't see it again. Well, one, we now know better. But second, that character is now retired. So unless someone buys that pendant from the shop, we're not going to see that happen again. All right, and lastly, Digital Maverick dropped us a note to say, just wanted you to know that I got so many tips from watching your playthrough of Gloomhaven Scenario 60 the other night, so thank you. Well, that's awesome, Maverick. I just hope one of those tips wasn't to use a pendant of dark packs to get you back to use a cloak of vis visually. Don't, don't do that. Don't take that tip. I gotta say, I love getting feedback like this. I am glad people are finding something to like and something useful in these videos. Uh, they're not something we planned to do. Like, we had no real intention to live stream Gloomhaven when we started this whole thing. But just the popularity of it, it it's become some of our most popular content. So that's pretty awesome. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. You're here live. Remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. Uh, tonight, we're talking house rules. So I want to see from you fine folk in the lobby, what are your favorite house rules? Which games and which house rules? Uh, in the chat room so far, we've got comments like, winner cleans up wouldn't work. Needs to be owner cleans up for me. <laughs> All right. I, I guess owner cleans up whoever's house it is. Personally, I don't think it should be win It should be everyone cleans up. Like, if you are playing with board game with everyone, stick around, help clean up, unless someone says, don't. <laughs> like, uh, assume you're going to stay and clean up. I remember Jamie in particular. Anytime he came to his house, he would literally just sweep everything into the box lid because he he wanted his games put away a certain way. 
that the, he was ready to take them out. So he and he considered that's a part of the lonely fun of board gaming. He's like, no, no, after you guys go home, I now know two hours of sorting baggies and stuff and making sure my game's in perfect shape to get going. So I, I'm just amused by the concept of like the winner or the loser. Like I said, to me, I, I think I'd want to make it punishing, make it, oh, if you lose this game, you got to clean it up. But no, everyone chip in. Every everyone, please help clean up. Offer to help uh, at least if if the uh, owner or store or whatever doesn't need you to. That's cool. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of cleaning up. I like cleaning up. The only problem is when you get those people who need it to be cleaned up in a very yeah. specific way and unfortunately aren't able to communicate easily how they want that cleaned up. Like, if you've got a certain way, fine. I'll help you clean it up that way. But if you can't tell me how you want it cleaned up, yeah, there's only so much I can do. One uh, of these days, I'm actually going to take the dang Sharpie and write on all the plastic bags of what goes in them. Like, it's such a great idea, but I yeah. just, I never do it. I never, like, I need to have it down there when I'm, I don't know. It, it, it's lonely fun that I just, I have better things to do. I'd rather sort a new game or punch something new. But that is something that would definitely help. Yep. See, that's a Jeff saying owner puts it away because he needs to put his games away just so. Just, uh, this has nothing to do with our podcast, but the NBA just suspended their season. Wow. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. No more basketball. Yeah. <clears throat> Watch yeah. more reboxing. Well, yeah, well, I'll start doing live reboxing, reboxing videos. Yeah. That'll be a new thing. It's different than unboxing. Exactly. You know, there's always, uh, there's always that, something. That might be our, our, our new market. We, we, Which, Ramaya, I keep totally forgetting I have a box insert to build. I got to do that someday. It's in a pile. I know where it is. All right. Let's keep moving. All right. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, we're on social media, too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Best way is to get questions to us is go through the website. That way they don't get lost. But we're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion on house rules, tabletop games, based on a topic suggestion from Charles Burroughs who contacted us on MeWe saying a webisode on house rules might be fun. Well, thanks for the topic suggestion, Charles. I got to say, it's not quite a question, but I think it fit, right? Like, I think we're still answering a question here. I think it's a good topic. I, I, I was thinking about that. I'm like, it's not really a question for the Ask the Bellhop, but no, he wants to hear us talk about house rules. So I'm up for that. Uh, first off, I don't have a nice Todd Crapper intro or a, 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 a definition panda with us to define it, but... Basically, by house rules, what I mean, and maybe Sean will disagree, but I think we're probably all on the same page, is any rules that you add and apply to a game you're playing that aren't in the rule book, that aren't in the book, aren't in the, 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 the core rules and the FAQ or whatever. And I think it also includes rules for situations that aren't covered in the book. Now, that more goes into role-playing games, where if you have a set way of handling a certain situation that's not covered in the book, that's also a house rule. One of the most common examples of that is what do you do when a die falls on the floor? You're not going to find that in many rule books. Actually, I don't think I've ever seen that. I want to write a game just so I can put a rule for what happens if the dice fall on the floor, just for that sake. But I think that also falls under house rules, right? Uh, though that's partially social contract, too. But what do you do if a dice is cocked? What do you do if it falls on the floor? Uh, what do you do if someone bumps the board? All those kind of things. You may have, uh, like I said, house rules. It's, it's the rules that are different if I go to my place and play or if I go to Sean's place to play, where we're talking role-playing, if I go play under... Uh, Kevin Doak's Warhammer game, if he's like, we, we don't use these rules and we use these rules, what are those? That's what I mean by house rules. So the uh, the Wikipedia definition, and I, I agree, I completely agree with what you, but just to, to sort of do a little more concise, the official Wikipedia definition is house rules are unofficial modifications to official game rules adopted yep. by individual groups of players. House rules Fair. may include the removal or alteration of existing rules or the addition of new rules. There. Yep, that's where to, I, whoever wrote that on Wikipedia writes better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that sums it up pretty good, right? So so anything that's not in the book, whether whether you're adding to the book or anything you want to take out of the book. I think that's a basic thing. Now, uh, we're going general. We're talking tabletop. Uh, this is not just a board gaming podcast. We also talk about RPGs. And here is somewhere where there is a definite divide, a definite split, a different difference in opinion. Because in general... House ruling is discouraged in most board games because it's a game and the rules are the rules and must be followed. 
Whereas it's honestly the opposite in most RPGs. Almost every RPG I own that's come out since 1980 or later has a rule, usually called Rule Zero, that states you can ignore the rules if you want to. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I, well, I think one thing you'll also find, uh, even split again between the board gamers, is the you know the the family gamers, the the fun gamers yeah. versus the competitive gamers. Obviously, if you are a competitive gamer, there are rules that need to be followed, or winning mm -hmm. means nothing. But yeah. if you've got a game that oh, you know what, it's a good game, but it would be way more fun if we got had a a way to refresh the deck. A little mm -hmm. more often than in a house rule, and all of a sudden that game gets to the table more often because it's yep. a little bit more fun, and you're not selling it off because it just didn't do it for you. Um, and I've seen that a lot in BGG forums where you get mm -hmm. a, a certain type of player who just wants to get more use out of the games they own, and Fair. a little tweak will get that to the table. Yeah, I, th I think the key thing there. And this is pretty much what I put down in the notes because uh, we're we're not as scripted as usual tonight. Uh, I think the key thing there is: is it a competition or not? Are you are you playing a game? Using the term a game, is there a winner? Is someone trying to win? Is there going to be a winner tonight? So, in board games in general, even party games are pretty much co competitions, right? There's there's a winner, there's a loser. Everyone in the competition needs to be playing by the same rules and on the same page. Whereas RPGs, again, in general, there are exceptions, aren't competitions. There's no winner. It's all about having a good time together, playing through, experiencing, and creating a story. Rules aren't important as keeping the game flowing, keeping things interesting, keeping immersion, um, and just making things as exciting as they can be. The one rule you'll hear about in modern games is the rule of cool, where what's more interesting to the story at this moment, that's what the rule means. Now, what about, um, when we're talking about RPG, what about Adventure League? Uh, is there a house ruling, a rule in Adventure League? Like, are they allowed to modify, verify, or modify, change things? So, yeah, I did say there's exceptions. So, when competition is added to RPGs, that's when rule adherence comes back. That's when rule zero gets thrown out the window, and that's when I where you tend to see that as organized play. As well as tournaments. Yes, there are tournaments. And what you generally have there is multiple players play through the same adventure or the same story under different DMs, all using the same rules, rule system. And here's where you want the rules to be followed. You don't, they, they, they allow for some modification by the GM, but not of the rules or the letter of the module. Like you have to do this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, but how you do it may be different. There is more room for interpretation. But what the goal is there is you want the player to know what to expect when they get to the table. So the same thing. This is why board games have codified rules, is when you sit down, everyone is going to be playing. Everyone knows what to expect. Everyone knows what's happening. It's the one thing everyone has at com in common at the table is the rules. So I can gather people from all over the world who've never met each other, sit down to play a D&D Adventures League table, and we all have that one thing in common. We all know the rules. Well, assuming the players know the rules. But we all should know the rules. You know how to make a strength check. You know how to make an attack roll. You know what hit points are. You know what all that is. The, and the goal is to have a common experience between all the players. Now, this is different, because as time has gone on, Adventures League in particular is very different from when I ran Living Forgotten Realms. When I ran D&D Living Forgotten Realms, which is part of the RPGA, which was the organized play for 4th edition before, you literally had to take a rule test to become a GM. I had to go online, and it was a time test where I had to... You were allowed to use the books, because one of the skills as a game master is to be able to look up stuff in the books, but there's no way you had enough time to look up everything. Like, you had to have a good general knowledge, and some of it was like, what's the AC of a boulette? And yeah, I had to look that up, I don't know. But then something else was like, how do you calculate... What are the various modifiers that apply when fighting on a Wayne so kill, right? And you needed to know, well, there could be fog, there could be weather, and so on. And there was a test you had to take. They've dropped that. That's no longer required. So that's a good show that they don't care as much. Plus, the adventures are much more open, not linear, and open to GM interpretation. Now, that said, every Adventure League module starts off with a section that is basically the rules for what rules you can ignore and modify. So it'll say, like, you can't kill this NPC, you can't 
do this. You can't burn down this shop because it's supposed to be a living world. So there's still rules, but they have gotten looser over the years. Whereas if you're playing at your home table, all of that's out the window. Do what you want. And that's encouraged by the company, which is also a slight change. The 3.5 and 3.0 rules for D&D in particular wanted everyone's table to feel the same. So you could go to the next city over, post in your fan-friendly local game store, I'm looking for a group, and join in and play. They seem to have finally moved away from that and, and again, gotten more lax. But there was definitely a, a focus on rules at that time. Uh, whereas I guess it, you, you, it's interesting because we talk about, you know, everyone sits down and knows the same. Whereas you look at some games and uh, over time they have become uh, distinct from their rules. For instance, yes. I would be interested to know how many copies of Monopoly out there actually even have a rule book in them. I mean, I, yeah. I never had a copy of, uh, I mean, now in the modern ones probably more often, but in the older copies of Monopoly, they, I mean, those rules just disappeared. Uh, and that's a lot of why some of the house ruling on Monopoly, mm -hmm. and I think that's some of the, the most famous house rulings exist in Monopoly. Everyone knows about uh, the variety of them. It came about because those rules weren't in the box anymore. Yeah. Uh, they disappeared. They got thrown away. Everyone thought they knew the game and played, and it just evolved um, slowly. Uh, and I was reading an interesting article the other day about learning from Monopoly, and one of the things you can learn is that you should develop your game so that it flows naturally. And yeah. one of the reasons that house rules get developed because a game doesn't flow naturally. And, mm -hmm. and people have introduced ways to make that game flow in a way that the playtesters and designers should have maybe thought about doing Possibly it. Possibly thought of. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, there's definitely a, actually... Once we talk about this a bit more, I do want to talk about some specific examples, including the, the popular Monopoly ones, which I think everyone listening to this is probably knows of them, but there are people out there that have no idea. Now, I know back in the day, though, a lot of the rules used to be on the cover of the box. That was a thing, and box topping, right, yeah, was, a, was a thing, Monopoly. So, so, often, yeah. well, I mean, so many so games Monopoly was one. Like yeah. a lot of the games at the time. So if you, as long as you didn't lose the lid, you didn't lose the rules. But, like, to be honest, I, it, a lot of games were oral traditions back then. Monopoly, almost all the games, I learned to play from someone else. So, yep. Yep. But a lot of what people did to house rule games, though, was to make them less competitive and more open and more fun, uh, especially for families. So you didn't want to hurt someone's feelings, so you get rid of the backstabby rules. Right. Or you want to make the game simpler because auctions are complicated versus you land on a spot and get a thing. So that's where a lot of that came from. And I think people, while trying to make the games more friendly, made them worse. Like, they, oh, they <laughs> basically ruined the games, right? Yep. Like, that's kind of the problem. Um, like you mentioned earlier, though, the, the whole tie-in here, though, is, is is the game meant to be competitive or not? And that's where, like you said, the the where most people are going to break the rules are games where you're looking for the experience. Like, the most common house rule in my entire house that gets used the most often is when we play concept, we throw the scoring out the window. We play, I don't even know, if we don't even play teams properly. We literally play, whoever guesses the right answer gets to be the person giving the clues next time. There's nowhere in the book that says that. It's not even suggested. But amusingly, there is a spot from the designer where they say, throw out the scoring rules. So, which I'm like, why'd you even put them in there? But I think it's just for that player like yep. last week, we were talking about a certain Carcassonne player locally. That guy needed those scoring rules to be in concept, I think. So so party games are definitely one where no one cares who wins. And if no one cares who wins, no one cares about the rules because it's no longer a competition. It's now just, meh, we'll just keep doing it. And Jeff asks, uh, is it a house rule if the concept rule book has a sidebar? And I would say yes, because you have to make an active choice to go with yeah. either A or B. And that choice is the house rule. You know, it's, in our it's, house, it's, we play this this version of the rules, even though even though they are both legitimate versions of the rules. Yeah, it's not actually listed as an official variant. What it basically says, it doesn't have a sidebar that says you can throw this out. It says here are scoring rules if you need them. Is basically the way it's worded. Whereas I think I don't need them. But yeah, it's, it's variants versus versus house rules is definitely a thing. Which variants you use, I think, is a form of house rules. 
um, but they're not your own. Like they're they're not host specific. They're right. well, they probably are host specific, but they're not created by you. You didn't add anything to the rules. But what options you play with? Because uh, there's one I don't have in the show notes. I got to try to remember later for terraforming Mars. I thought of which is definitely one that that's a mix of variants that are in the book. And it's and to me that's a good thing. Like if a designer knows that people are host ruling, they should be released as official variants. And that's something that's coming more and more common with social media and sites like Board Game Geek, where someone will propose it, and then eventually the designer will get involved and go, oh, wow, that's a great concept. Yep. And that happened recently. I don't know how it's going to end in the long run, but with Gorinto. We were playing Gorinto four-player, and I came up with a, a different way to do a couple things. I'm like, two of the problems we found with the game was the, the fourth player not having enough interaction and four players being slow and not getting enough drafting. And he's like, well, just do this or this. And we went back and forth and came up with some cool ideas. And then he's he's like, wow, I like those. I got to talk to the designer. So it's possible some of those will end up in the final game. And I like the fact that we're seeing that, that we'll see an official FAQ or an official thread saying, hey, here's a different way to play our game that people have discovered either makes it more fun or at least gives more options. Yeah, well, and definitely the introduction of social media and the worldwide concept of... Uh not playtesting after release because we don't we don't <laughs> we don't like that we don't think that no. should be needed but no. just because even if you have playtested a game uh and you're happy with its results that doesn't mean that someone else isn't going to come up with something you never could have thought of yeah. uh or used something in a in a different way sometimes it's a mistake that turns out to be beneficial or sometimes it's just that particular group likes playing in a way that uh is different than yours you know i i see over time and time again on the BGG forums, I've seen people who's like, you know, I don't like this game, but I'm gonna house rule it this way, this way, this way, this way, yep. and our guys are, and when we're and we're gonna play it all the mm -hmm. time, and that's not something I'm interested in. If I don't like a game, I'm not going to redesign it uh, because I, personally, I feel like the designer has a vision, and I just see that vision, and that game's not mm -hmm. for me. But the fact that there are people out there uh, like that is a good thing. You know, it's getting that game out there, you know, purchased and played. That, and I think most people, not necessarily most people listen to this podcast, most people listen to this podcast are probably closer to the way we play, which is multiple games a few times. But there are definitely people out there that buy one or two games a year and play the heck out of them. Oh, yeah. And those are the people that are going to host rule. Like, like we, our group of friends uh, has a group that play Catan, but they have full war rules. They hated the fact that it wasn't interactive enough. And they had this very cutthroat, very war-based, they produced a book. Like, they could probably publish their variant if, like, the Catan license wasn't so tight. Like, they they have spent a lot of years playtesting this. Uh, there's there's a tackle box involved with extra bits. Like, like it's a whole thing. And it, it looks like a good game. But at that point, to me, you're not playing Catan. The ones I like to see that are a little more common are just the, we feel the game's too short, so we play an extra turn. Or we feel the game's too loose, and we cut it a turn early. Or, like you said, we reshuffle the deck once. Or, yeah. and, and those are nice, quick, simple fixes that are basically, are we having fun at this time? Why don't we continue this fun? And it's probably not going to ruin the overall experience in any way. Yeah, and I see, you'll sometimes see little things, little changes uh, in a game. Like, I know when the Monster Box of Monsters came out, they introduced a, a refresh, the, uh, refresh the shop rule uh, in... Uh, the Harry Potter last thing, which I am sure came out of, you know, BGG forums and people house ruling the fact mm. that every once in a while you could get something where it was just buy any cards on the yeah. uh, on the play field. Yeah, and, everything's too expensive. You know, and you don't wanna you wanna be able to balance it. You don't want to be able to just ah whenever wipe it and you know wipe it until you get something you want. But you know, they needed a little something because all of mm. a sudden, you know, you start off with five points and oops you accidentally dealt out something where everything costs seven yeah yeah mulligan rules in card games are very common yeah. but I, either as house rules or sometimes included in the game like even when we used to play magic the gathering i'm pretty sure we had a rule before the official rule if you drew all land you get or all creatures you got to redraw it's interesting right? I, the, the new the new version of mulligan in the game is very different um it's actually so if you choose to take a mulligan and you can for any reason uh you then get a chance. You then draw another seven cards, but only keep six of them, and then you yeah. can mull in again, again and, and only have five. Only get four, five, and, three, and yeah. so far, so you can. Yeah, it's it's really interesting the way they've done that, and it can really change because you can mull in for any reason, just to really get that. You know. Yeah. If if your if your deck relies on one specific card, yeah. 
you, you can, might want to take those multiple mulligans. Yeah, you can yeah. do it. Like, like our, I know swords were being probably the most closest modern version of magic we played. Yes, I know it's not magic. Uh, it had a mulligan rule that had to do with if you have no minions in your hand, yep. you can redraw it with no penalty just to, until you have minions. I remember Keyforge had something. I don't remember what. Yeah, there was something. There, there was something. But yeah, those are common. But overall, I got to admit, I'm, I'm on Sean's page. I have always been a big proponent of playing by the rules as written. Uh, again, the designer put the rules there for a reason. And unless I see an official variant from the designer, I tend to stay away from them. But I consume a lot of games. If there's a part of a game I don't like, I'll probably just play a different game I like more. Or yeah. if there's a part of the game I don't like, I'm probably going to tolerate it because I like the rest of the game. I'm not one to house rule off. And there are a couple that I do, which, again, I'm going to mention some specifics later. Because they don't actually change the gameplay. They just speed it up and things like that, like allowing simultaneous play with a game that doesn't actually have it, stuff like that. But I prefer to play the game raw. The one thing I personally insist on and this is something I think everyone should do, and it's like basically the thing you teach your kids is try it before you add the ketchup on it, is play the game. Like, don't go online, see the house rules, and try use them right away. Like, play the game normal with the full rules, in my opinion, at least twice before you start house ruling something. Give, give the designers, developers, and publishers enough credit that they knew what they were doing instead of walking in and house ruling right away. That's a that's a personal opinion. Like, if anyone was playing any of my games, I'd be offended to hear, see, oh, I read this, and this sounds dumb, so I changed it before our first game. I'd be offended. I'd be like, come on, just try it. Try it with the actual rules first. Yeah. And a uh, amusing anecdote to that is the f Fate? No, it's not Fate. Burning Wheel role-playing system. Now, I don't own Burning Wheel, but I own Mouse Guard. And Luke Crane is very much of the same opinion of... My game is written in a certain way to evoke a certain experience using certain mechanics to do that, and you should follow it. Except he's very pedantic about it and says it right in the rule book that thou shall not change any of these rules or house rule this game, which I got to admit felt very off-putting. And when I read that book, there was some stuff that sounded really weird. I was tempted to just throw out the window, and we sat down to play Mouse Card for the first time with our usual Monday night group, and we played two sessions. We made characters. We said, you know what? I don't like this rule, but we're going to try it. We're going to play two sessions using all the rules in this book to the fullest, every card, every die roll, every minus one plus one, and see how it works. And sure enough, it worked. And it was one of the most limiting role-playing games I've ever played that somehow felt freeing because it was so limiting. Like, it was just, because our options were limited, we were more creative, I think is a, is a way to look at it. Oh, absolutely. All right, so one other role-playing thing I do want to mention is the whole OSR movement, right? Old school rules. So we talked about, and this, this basically comes out of it. I said, like, the 3.0, 3.5 rules for D&D, &D, which came out in the year 2000, was a, a concentrated effort to make every table playing D&D &D the same. That was the goal of the system. That was the goal Monty Cook had. He wanted you to be able to walk into anyone's, I'm going to stop using basement, walk into anyone's game room, and sit down and play D&D &D and know how to play and be able to play with them, which I do think was a valiant effort, and there is merit to that concept. But people fought back against that, and to me, that's when the OSR movement out. No, OSR is for old-school renaissance, old-school revival. The point is going back to an older style of play where the thing was they didn't know they needed rules for everything or decided consciously they didn't need them. The main one I think of where they didn't know is no one even thought to put a skill system in D&D. &D. Like, just the concept hadn't happened. Why would I need a list of things my character can and can't do? I'm a warrior. Of course I can tip over wheelbarrows and I can smith my own swords. And I'm a wizard. Of course I can read and write, right? Like, And what that goes to is because there were gaps in the rules, everything was house rule. Like, there was no rule. And that gets to the concept of rulings over rules where the GM, DM, Game Master, whatever you want to call it, is basically a moderator, someone who is there to interpret the rules and extrapolate them into different situations. And there is a huge push to go back to that. And a lot of modern story games are really push that, though they're not necessarily OSR. Even if you're not doing dungeon crawls, if you're having a romantic date, it's still more about rulings over rules, which is definitely a shift in the way people look at it. And, and a move towards house rules being the rule. And I have to say, when it comes to RPGs, I tend to I tend to lean this way, and I know you and I differ on this one, yep. which is funny because you've been my GM for ninety yep. percent of my role playing life. Uh, but the the 
to me, a lot of what a role-playing game brings to the table is its environment. Uh, the reason I love Warhammer is not because of their roll to hit table. It's because of the world of roll Warhammer. Uh, and now there are absolutely some parts of the mechanics that I enjoy. I enjoy career advancement system uh, within it. But realistically, it is the world of Warhammer that I enjoy playing in. Mm -hmm. And if you told me I had to use Thaco instead of a D100, okay. Yeah. I, I want to play in the world of Warhammer. And that system happened to bring that to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's there's a whole lot of that. But I can definitely see, you know, both sides of it. You know, again, especially as we get into the more modern games, these, again, we've got to this modern world of playtesting and this modern world of, of, of game development where designers are able to put so much more time and thought and effort mm -hmm. into their games so that when they deliver it to you, you are doing them a disjustice to ignore what they've done. Yeah. <laughs> So my, my big thing is at least try it. I tend to stick with raw. Now, the most important thing, though, if you are ever going to use house rules, is the, the thing we've mentioned many times, have the conversation before the game starts. We're, we can call it session zero. You can call it whatever you want. Session zero is a role-playing term, but it applies to board games. You should never, ever surprise someone with a house rule. It is always something that should be discussed before the game starts, possibly before even the game night's planned. Especially if you're going to play some big epic game like Twilight Imperium, I don't want to show up to your house and find out you're using some variant where you start five turns in where everyone's got a full fleet. Maybe what I enjoy about Twilight Imperium is the buildup, and you just took that away from me. You need to have everyone on the same page and get everyone to agree to every house rule before you start playing. Now, RPGs, that's a little harder because there is that rulings over rules. But if there's certain things that you've codified for your group, like, yeah, there's no rules for skills in D&D, &D, but we use a D6 and we add our stat, tell people that, right? Like, let people know. That in, in, in RPGs in general, that's the kind of stuff, I, in my opinion, you should document. You should have a, a sheet, a set of rules for your house rules. And if it is, the DM's going to wing it every time. Fair enough. That's your house rule. But board games even more so, right? Any game where it's a competition. Again, if your RPG is a competition and you're playing for money or you're running through the same adventure the other group did last week to see who did better, whatever it is. If, if you're making it a game, if you're making a competition with winners and losers, everyone's got to be on the same page. Everyone has to know all the rules at the table, house rules and official, what's been added in and what's been taken out. And this, this gets to be a problem in some ways because of what we talked about earlier with Monopoly, where people think they know the rules. Uh, you know, the number of, of rules that, ex that are house rules that people aren't aware are house rules, uh, especially on games that, you know, have a history behind them yeah. that have evolved in that method of, you know, verbal, uh, verbal explanations. You've, you may have never seen a set of rules for game X, but mm -hmm. you know how to play it because you've been playing it since you were, you know, a toddler. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, you know, most people don't know they need a session zero for Uno or for Monopoly, yep. where I guarantee you're going to play both those games wrong 90% of the time, unless you are the kind of unless you're already aware that, that yeah. knows that these rules are all wrong. All right. I think that's a good uh, segue into actually talking about some of those examples. So what is the Uno one? I always forget. There, there's two that I know you're people not mess up in to, Uno. You're not allowed to stack uh pickups on each other yeah you can't play i thought there were others so there's so you can't play a plus two then a plus two then a plus yeah. four or any of that um another is at the end of your turn if you can't play you keep drawing until you can yep a lot of people ditch that rule and you only draw one and then it passes to the next player which is too forgiving uh plus it stops play and you could just keep going around yep. which is not good and then there's something with there, there's actually social deduction in uno and a lot of people don't use that well, yeah, the, um, if, if, you, you, if can you don't play, play the a, right card, you, you can get called out on it. But you can cheat. You can yeah. play oh, the yeah, wrong absolutely. card. And if no one calls you out on it, especially with the plus four change color, you're only supposed to be able to play that if you can't play. But you can play it when you can play. But then yeah. if the person next to you calls you out on it, yeah. you then have to draw the cards. Again, this is, I don't play Uno enough, but there are a bunch. And again, yeah, yeah. almost all of these rules were added to make it more family friendly. Make it more family friendly. Or make it more punishing, which is yeah. a weird one. The, the fact you were allowed to stack punishments was yeah. just 
like a way for siblings to beat each other up in a game. Like Basically. really. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So those are some Uno ones. What do we got from uh, Monopoly? So Monopoly, I mean, the big one that I think everyone knows of is free parking. Yeah. Uh, you know, the where, but the, it's it's different because there are so many house rule variations. There's variations on free parking. On free parking. Yes. So what goes there? The actual rule is free parking is just nothing. nothing. It's nothing. Yep. It's a spot where you where absolutely nothing happens. Yet I have seen an automatic two hundred dollars. I have That's seen good. all the money from taxes. Or yep. all the money from auction, you know, basically chance any money cards. that goes back yep. in. Yeah, I've seen all the money. I've seen money from chance cards. All the money is like terrible. Like whoever oh, yeah. came up with that, <laughs> they, like it becomes the bank. Yeah, essentially. Cool. So again, what this was put in was to make the game more fun to have a catch-up mechanic. Yeah. So, so your little brother who doesn't understand buying properties can land there and be happy and still be in the game. But it's terrible because the whole point of the game is to take money out. That's how yeah. you lose is to run out of money. And if you keep putting money back into that system, like, no wonder so many people think Monopoly's too long. Like, well, and Monopoly's already too long because even if you play by the rules, you've got between five and six rolls before you get more money anyway. Uh, you yeah, know, you gotta get around the board. Yeah, to get around, the, you know, it only takes five or six rolls to get around that board generally, and then you're gonna have more money. Even, you know, so the, the fact that you're adding another mechanic to... To add more money into the system is essentially falsely inflating the economy of the system yes. and that doesn't work we've got all sorts of economics uh professors everywhere across the world who will tell you that you know false inflation <laughs> fails yeah see monopoly would work if as that happened the values of the properties all went up right. <laughs> then there we get go. a more realistic simulation <laughs> by adding more money go. in we the pot the money's we need, we need inflation, inflation on, on prices as well as inflation on income here. yes uh so another one i've heard many times is if you land on go you get double the money yep which again just adding more money in for no reason and then of course the biggest the one that most people don't even know is wrong is the auction because in Monopoly, when you land on a property, you don't have to buy it. You can say no. Yep. And then that property goes up for auction. And what's interesting is you could bid in that auction and possibly get it cheaper than you would have just for landing on it. Yep. Uh, but the auction is, again, as a family game, the auction tends to be too complex for younger players, or at least is thought of as too complex for younger players, and gets thrown out. Uh, I never, I never knew about the auction until the first time I played it on as a as a computer game. Oh, there you go. Okay, that was See, my the family never used auction. Played have the free parking rule. Yeah, a like, lot. I, of, I've seen it. Like, like even even a the, lot. The, a lot of them will have a toggle, especially like a lot of the more common house rules are toggleable yeah. in the computer games because again, that's how people grew up playing Monopoly, and it ruins yeah. the game for them if yep. they don't want to play. If they don't play it that way. Although I, I just want them all to sit down and play the real way once and probably go, hey, this is better than I remember. Uh, there's, right. also, there's, there's also some house rules about landing on, uh, I believe it's your own properties. It's not one I've ever played with, but it's one I heard of recently where there, there's, you can like get money if you land on your own property sort of thing. It's, again, it's another one of these that. things that just ends the game, which is yeah. already a painfully long game. <laughs> Yeah, I've also seen the other thing is you have to build your properties evenly. So on, you have to build each one, one at a time. Right. Where I've seen people where they build a hotel right away on just one spot. You can't do that. Right. But again, that, that just increases the random factor that someone's going to lose there and get eliminated from the game prematurely. Yeah. Which I guess at, at least it doesn't make the game longer. Uh, not getting income while you're in jail is another one. That's a house rule. Yeah, I was gonna say, you still get income, yeah, don't you? But, yeah. but yeah. some people will house rule it so that when you're in jail, so you're in you jail, don't get so any you income. Can't. So they're trying to add some realism to Monopoly. <laughs> All right. I, there was an interesting one where I had someone had built a board and they built railroad tracks between the railways and you were allowed to cross over. I thought that was interesting sounding at least. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of variations. So we're using Monopoly as our main example because there's so many. Uh, some other ones. Here's an interesting one where people take a social game and, and break the rules. And that, and I see this happen every group you played it with, is play Hanabi or The Mind with two different groups of people and see what their, I'm gonna, their house rules, because you're not allowed to do what most people do in both those games. Like in the mind, you are not supposed to communicate at all. So whether that's the, I hold my hand up, I almost put it, or how close, the one I've noticed in the mind, watching people play is how close they lean in to the table. So if they got they want to play soon, they lean in, and if they want to play 
they, they're like, oh, I got a bad card. They lean way back. Technically, you're breaking the rules. But you know what? It's the mind. It's fun. It's just a, it's just a, 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 an experience. And Hanabi, the ways people hold their cards, my God. Or the, this is a two, and this is a two. <laughs> you see it all the time. Um, but you know what? If you're having fun. Who cares, right? The, the... To me, that's actually quite a part of the Hanabi. And I had a discussion uh, on Twitter the other day because I've only ever played it digitally. And, and was, I'm like, I can't even see how you can play that without. Of, it's just a kind of silly game. And the only thing you can guess is uh, when someone has marked something as as a color or right. a number, you might be able to get, to, to get something out of that based on timing. But mm. uh, but really, you're you're just kind of playing it to kill time. It's, yeah. Uh, Whereas where, the actual game with, with the, the social cues and the yeah. hints. And, and there's nothing wrong with the way you're saying something being part of it. I mean, that's I, I, unless the rules outright state, you know, must speak in monotone, uh, you know, that's part that of the has, fun. No, they do. They say you're not allowed to, to give additional info with how you're saying the numbers of the colors. So you're not supposed to be like, that's a two, you know, with your five. Yeah. Fa- I've, I've seen so It's amusing. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's almost a hobby of mine is to watch people play Hanabi. Oh, what's this group going to do? Right. And yeah. every group has their own idiosyncrasies. Yeah. And then if you mix those players, oh, it's so funny because the mix signals. Right. They're like, whoa, whoa, wait, you just turned that card side. What the hell does that mean in your group? You know, <laughs> it is. It's, it's amusing to see. Uh, so here's one that I actually think is a great house rule that should be part of the rules. And that is playing Carcassonne or any other tile laying game, Soro or any of those. And that is after your turn, draw the tile as opposed to at the start of your turn. Because in Karak, you're supposed to draw the tile. Literally in the rules of Karak, you're also supposed to show all the other players so they can help you place it. But do it at the end because that lets you plan ahead. That gives you every other player's turn to figure out where that tile is going to fit. It like literally, I would say triples the speed of being able to play Kark if you know what your next tile is, and even BGA does it. BGA shows you up in the top right what your next tile is going to be. Uh, it doesn't show you your tile; it shows you the next tile. I thought it showed your next. Oh tile, yes, your, no, you're right. It does. Tile. It shows you the next tile for everybody up center, and then your own tile. Your own your tile on, on, yeah. uh, up by your name, yeah. because this is just such a good variant to just to speed up what's what's a. It's not a slow game, but. It, it takes out a lot of the AP. And like I said, every tile laying game should have this rule. This is, this is to me, it should be in the rules, not a house rule. The only, the only problem is it does give you a little bit of advantage if you know what your, car, what your card is going to be and you're seeing what everyone else's card is as they're, as they're laying it out. You can... Yeah, but that only matters if you're going to be a dink and influence them. <laughs> Don't put it there. Like, like you, what your tile you have shouldn't influence what they're playing. Right. Because you can't see the next player's tile. Yep. I can just see the one that's currently being played in my next one. Now, in a way, like, okay, there there are people out there that believe in the gods of fate and don't actually believe in randomness that think that next tile is theirs. It might upset those people. Yep. Or the people who like card counting and are going to get upset that you drew the last four before your turn when you draw the last four because technically you're drawing the next player's tile instead of your own. But come on, like, like, it, that's ridiculous. It's the same people that if I have to deal out five cards from the top of the deck to everyone would get upset whether I grab a stack of five and hand them to you or if I go around the table, one, two, three, four, five. If the deck is random, it doesn't matter. Yep. All right. I think a, a hobby game we should probably talk about just because there are a bunch of variants for it is Catan. Um, Catan has a lot of variants out there. I think just because it's so popular, it probably has as many house rules as Monopoly. And from what I'm hearing, Catan is starting to turn into Monopoly this way, in that people are learning it from their friends, teaching their friends, and there is now becoming this verbal tradition of Catan because everyone sees that rule book and it scares them. Now, one of the things to note in the Catan rule, but half of its background and, and talking about the, the time period and farms and all this stuff, the actual rules aren't that big, but the book's like thick, like 13 pages versus, you know, the top of a box when you were growing up is a big deal. Now, one of the ones I actually like and I think is a pretty solid one is you ignore the robber. You ignore the, the when you roll a seven, you lose half your resources, move the robber and steal something for the first X turns. And this is where people seem to, to vary. Um, what this does is it lets people actually start building up resources early and doesn't mess anyone over at the beginning of the game so you can start building an engine. Now, the debate out there is how many turns. I personally think it should go at least once around the table 
but some people actually think you should go around the table twice or three times before the robber comes in. I would say at least don't just give like the first player an advantage or second, like the first turn time a player rolls. I see that one quite a bit. Now I don't know who Sean has frozen on me. So hopefully we haven't lost all good here. All right. Your Skype just froze. I don't know why. So I thought that was neat. Um, I don't think you played enough Catan to really comment on it. Yeah, no, I, I'm, Catan's all right. I just, again, it's never one of those yeah. games that I've gotten uh, deeply involved in. All right. So to me, that's, that's a solid house rule. I have nothing wrong with it. But again, agree before you start playing, because that does change the dynamics of the game. Now, there are also a number of people who play with some form of variant for when you, the dice are rolled and you get nothing. I am not a fan of this one, because almost all of these you get something when it happens and I've seen people give you a wild card resource, a resource of your choice. I've seen gold tokens that you can trade in. And when you do this, you literally are changing the balance of the game because by giving people a reward for rolling badly, it then devalues the good spots on the map. And the sixes and eights are good for a reason and are in place for a reason and are a big part of the strategy of where to push your starting cities. And if you start using that rule, you're going to have people that want to build on the twos and twelves, hoping they get nothing just to abuse that system. Like to me, it's off theme and changes the balance. And to go with that, I don't know how this is one that I've actually seen where people don't realize they're playing wrong is those tokens with the numbers on them go out in alphabetical order. There's letters on them that go A, B, C, D, E for a reason because you spiral out from the desert. And that's an important part of the game because it makes sure you never get a six and an eight next to each other. And I don't know how many games of Catan I've sat down where people randomize those tokens and it completely ruins the board because you just put one six next to one eight and let someone build there. They're probably going to win the game just because of the laws of probability. So those are house rules for Catan. I don't think anyone should use. You should throw them out. Now, one I do like is players got together and hated the randomness in Catan because it's, it's a 2d6. And while, in my opinion, the bell curve on 2d6 is pretty solid, some people get really upset that 2s and 12s get rolled too often or whatever, or they think that, that it's too good. So what they did is they put together a deck of cards that were the full distribution of 2d6, which is, I think, what, 36? So you have 1, 2, and then 3, whatever the, the proper bell curve is. And what you do is you use every card in the deck and then shuffle and start again. So you have to do it that way. Because then you get a standard bell curve every game. So, yes, 2 and 12 are only going to come up once before the deck shuffles. Some people prefer that. Uh, that was popular enough that Claus Tuber and Mayfair Games put out a deck that says Catan on it and it's themed. So that is a big deal, a, a big house rule that people enjoy enough and were popular enough that the designer said, hell yeah, and put out an official expansion for his base game so that you get that perfect bell curve every time. Yeah, I'm... I don't know. Randomness is randomness. Like, I don't love the idea of the so sort of messing with randomness. Just the bell curve is something that exists over, yeah. you know, a thousand rolls, not something that exists in 36 rolls. Correct. Um, you should not get unlikely that you would get a bell curve in 36 rolls. Yeah, in one game of Catan. Or some people want that. So now, if you want that, there's a deck you can buy. Yeah, that's so here you go. Here's a perfect example. Jeff Seuss is in our chat room and had no idea that the letters on the token mean something, or he's being sarcastic. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but it's possibly he's being sarcastic, but I would not be surprised if Jeff was taught to play Catan and never knew that the letters mean something. Yep. All right. Uh, here's one that we can get Sean back into the conversation because I know he plays one. It is card games, specifically cooperative card games, so Pandemic, Forbidden Desert, playing with open hands. Um, I, a couple games actually recommend it, but a lot of people recommend playing Pandemic or Forbidden Desert with open hands. Now, I think you do that for Harry Potter, don't you? Yeah, Harry Potter is generally, I, I'm trying to remember if they actually specifically state, but I believe it is fully open information as designed that okay. way. Okay. Um, because again, it's a fam, it is, it is generally a family game. Um, but yes, uh, it's something whereas I would be more cautious of it in a compet you know in a more competitive group because quarterbacking could absolutely be an issue um yeah. especially because of, of of the asymmetry in the characters um as you move up as you move on a little further 
uh, and, and develop your, your player powers in later years, um, there's definitely certain ways that certain characters can be played better. Um, and, and certain, you know, hey, you're playing Neville, so you want to try and maybe build your deck more this way because mm-hmm. it, it will work better after, because I've seen it work better. Fair enough. But yeah, I think I think it's a solid variant. But yeah, the quarterbacking, right? Because one of the okay. things that prevents quarterbacking is everyone having their own resources and people not knowing what that is. But you know what? When you're playing Pandemic, how many yellow cards did you have? Wait, did you have a blue? Like, just play them face up and you won't have that that conversation. Yeah, a uh, lot of people aren't good at at, memori- at counting cards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and on a, on a cooperative game, there's no need to be good at, co- at counting cards, right? It's exactly. Not that, that's not what the game's about. And that's true of almost any of these games, right? Like, there's no reason to count cards. So that leads me to something else, too, and that is scoring. Whether you keep your scoring open or closed. Uh, for example, Power Grid, by the rules, your money's secret. And that is by design so it reduces AP. So you don't try to figure out if you can outbid someone by one minute or not. Or not. Or, like, uh, sorry, outbid someone by one $1 or $2. And it's by design, but a lot of people, mainly because they hate the paper money, play with poker chips. And as soon as you throw poker chips and power grid, you can now count. And I've noticed these are the same people that say, well, power grid's too long a game. So there, you got to realize, and there's, there's another point to this, right? Realize that with house rules that there is a cost to using them. Now, that cost may be just a matter of having to teach everyone your new rules, but it might also change the balance of the game and change the overall experience. Well, and in many cases, it is intended to change the balance of the game but yes. there may be unintended ba- changes on top mm. of that right you know let's yes. let's add in let's add in the money to free parking so that everyone yes. has more fun except now you have you know game goes coupled on the <laughs> length of the game so all right i'm just gonna fire up a couple we've been talking about this for a while so here's some ones i like king of tokyo always use power up i don't know if that's a house rule but it's an expansion that to me is necessary always Give people a starting power. I personally like to give people two powers to pick from, so you draft two powers. You know why that is? I love asymmetric games. And the whole point of using power-up is that each of the monsters in King of Tokyo is unique. Why not start them off unique instead of requiring someone to roll three hearts on the dice before they get to do the cool thing? So that's one thing that gets to the monkey. It lets you do the cool thing right at the start of the game and adds asymmetry. So that's one I recommend for King of Tokyo power-up. Um, ticket to ride scoring at the end of the game. This is an interesting one, but this gets into the whole open scoring or not. And the big thing you got to watch for is any game where you can see everyone's points during the game, you're going to have, I'm going to say a feature of the game being knowing who's in the lead. And that encourages people to go after the player in the lead. Whereas if you hide the score, it's always a, a guess. You don't know who's in the lead. But it also means you're rewarding a different play experience. Like Sean said, you're not rewarding memorization. Whereas if scoring is hidden, you're rewarding people remembering what points everyone's at. So to me, that is not good or bad house rules. It's group dependent. It's what do you like to play? This is a big one for a lot of games where where if you want that, uh, king making is the wrong word. It's more leader chasing, where you want people to try to prevent, the, you know, catch the leader, you're going to want to use open money so everyone can see whereas if you'd rather be surprised at the end of the game who won then and reward people who do remember who's in the lead and who did what then you want to play the other way and then finally i just want to talk about rpgs just quickly the most common rule that everyone's probably heard of is encumbrance people like to throw that out the window and the other one is housekeeping style rules stuff like tracking m ammo downtime expenses the cost for food to drink replacing arrows stuff like that now, in most cases, I think this stuff should be waived. Hand waved, thrown out of the game. If your game's about saving the world from the encroaching evil, it doesn't matter if you bought the one copper grog or the five copper elven ale when you were at the bar. Meanwhile, if your game, though, is about resource management, if you are all about surviving in a hostile desert where every ounce of water is vital and how many days of rations you can carry may be the difference between life or death, then you want to keep those rules in. Yeah, it's one of those it's one of those interesting ones where I think it you can even sort of change depending even within the same group. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, day one, you're, you know, heading out from the village to go, you know, tackle a dungeon that's right outside the village. Fine, who cares how many arrows you've got or what it or or what things cost. But 
when you are going to track across the desert to get to the next, you know, country, mm -hmm. well, then, yeah, it does matter what you've got. And bef that first session you're, before you start, everyone had better detail out their backpacks that day. Even yeah. though you've never done it before, hey, we're doing a little bit of a different game today, so mm -hmm. let's do this today. Um, All right. Yeah, very true. And I've seen the exact opposite, too. Where at the beginning of the game, your characters are broke, so you want to track every arrow or every penny. But then eventually, after their first horde and they kill the dragon, they have thousands of gold. Who cares if they spend one or two copper, right? Yep. So it goes both ways. But you also have to you know, you look at things like management. You know, how you've, you've got your millionaire characters. How much of that gold is with you versus how much of it? Yeah. You know, we don't all have bags of holding to carry our entire dragon horde. Or do with. we care? Or it do it we care? totally yeah. depends what the adventure is about. Yeah. If you want the characters to be able to afford whatever they can, they afford whatever they can. If it's more about the manipulation or the politics or whatever. So I think at this point we're going to call it. That is our conversation on house rules. Uh, I think the important thing is it doesn't matter if you like them or not. They are a thing. Just make sure you have a conversation. Make sure you talk about it. Don't ever surprise someone with a house rule. I never want to be sitting down to play a game and have you do something that's against the rules and go, oh, sorry, that's how we play it here. That should never happen. You should always know that ahead of time. Uh, again, house rules in RPGs are common, but still should be discussed. What are your standard ones? What do you do different from the core rules? What do you do different from the base rules? What rule books do you allow, don't you allow? And board games, I think in general, you can assume you're playing by the rules, unless there's an exception. because. The driving force that I think we got to from this is if the game's about a competition, if there's a winner, if you are playing to win, you need to have hard and fast rules with everyone on the same page. If you're just playing to have fun, whether that's a role-playing game or a party game, who cares? Toss the rules out of the window, go with the rule of cool, do whatever's the most fun for your group. But but know the rules so that you can know what yes. your house rule is. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, always learn the game first. Try it with the rules. Trust the designer. That was something else we mentioned. T trust the designer, the publisher, the developers to have done their work and give the game a try with the full rules before making any house rules. Now that we're done our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to pop into the lobby and see what they think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently some people don't know Catan. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, Jeff is true. He didn't know the letters meant something, thought it was from some German version. So I wonder, Jeff, have you enjoyed Catan, or was there always a one runaway leader? Where did someone always got screwed over, whereas someone else always seemed to have all the resources they needed? Because that's what happens when you just put them out randomly. Is is Even if one player doesn't get a lucky placement, they're going to have some other players stuck. Uh, uh, Jeff's asking, are there board games with common fan content besides Arkham Horror, and do you consider those house rules? I, I guess they be, it depends. Uh, fan created content to me is not a house rule unless you change the rules. So if it's just a new scenario that uses all the rules that are in the original, I wouldn't necessarily say it, but I think in this case it counts as a house rule just for our conversation. I don't want to show up to your place to play your house to play Arkham Horror and find out we're doing a self-created scenario. You should tell me ahead of time, hey, do you want to come over and try out my self-created scenario? The uh, same thing if I sit down to a D&D &D game, I want to know if we're playing in the Forgotten Realms or we're playing in your homebrew universe or if we're playing Eberron. Or if we're playing Eberron, but we allow Tiflings from Forgotten Realms. I want to know all that ahead of time and not be surprised by it. But there are a lot of games where people create content. Basically, anything that's scenario-based, campaign-based, there's someone out there that's made fan content. But it's also true the popular games. There are people who have made their own Catan or Carcassonne tiles. There are definitely a lot of uh, fan-created Catan reasons. Yep. Well, I think we've, we've noticed even in some games uh, where there has been fan-created or fan-included content built into the Kickstarter, yes. where you've noticed, hey, you know what? I bet this was, and sure enough, that was fan-created content because yeah. it hasn't gotten that playtesting. And again, yeah. you've you run into the balance issue, right? When you, when you throw in a house rule, there will be almost certainly unintended effects as well as the effects that you were hoping to gain that house rule yeah yeah we definitely like gloomhaven's an example there were there were some scenarios we found were a little ridiculous yeah and because of that we looked it up and found out that was stuff added from the kickstarter that was created by fans so which was meant to be extra hard which is fair but I, it would have been nice to know that ahead of time yeah uh yeah they almost need a little you know star on them just so that you're aware that this you know wasn't play tested quite yeah 
Yeah, has wasn't really play tested as much. But yeah, overall, host rules are cool. Jeff, we should play Catan with the proper rules sometime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because, yeah, that's that's a very – that that's uh, people don't realize it, and those numbers are very important to Catan. I say you'll never have a 6 and an 8 next to each other. The 2 and 12 will never be next to each other using the proper rules. It also evenly distributes the rest of the numbers, with the 6 and the 8 being the most – because there's two 6s, two 8s. If any of those touch each other, anyone that builds there is great. Um, it also changes the distribution of the different resources, and there, there's a lot of reasons. That, that you should always play with the proper it's a spiral you start at a b c d and you go around in a spiral to the middle of the board skipping over the desert and that's right in the rule book so i don't know how that one got missed it's part Again, of it it's another... one of those things where Catan's another one it's been around yeah, it's big enough it's now been, it's been taught by other people to others without yeah. you know how many people have read the rule book for Catan before playing and then once you start hosting it you feel comfortable because you've played it so many times already. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we didn't get any house rules from our chat today, but fair enough. They, as far as I can tell, everyone in our chat room really likes to follow the rules, or at least the rules they think they know. <laughs> yep, there we go. So I, I think we're stuck that way. All right. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more. More things in the works all the time. So now the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your email inbox. Once a week, I send out an email. It recaps all the content we put out in the previous week. Blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, videos, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the Tabletop Bellhop website where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, we are going to continue taking a look at our revised Patreon project and the various tiers we offer. This will be our last official tier, but I do want to talk about some bonus rewards we have next week. This week, we're looking at the concierge access level. All right, this is our final and most expensive tier. At this point, you're basically hiring me as a personal consultant. We have this tier broken up into a variety of different services. Now, instead of getting into the nitty-gritty of what you get at each level, you can read that over at the Patreon page. We're just going to quickly summarize each of the options. So, option one, game night planning. Help me, let me help you plan your game night. What games, how long, how many people, what food, what drinks, who to invite, where to host it, etc. Option two, game library curation. Let me know what you've got now, what you kind of like, and let me help me help you fill out your personal board game library. Uh, if you're looking to call games, I could help with that as well. Option three, room with a review. Let me know what you want to review, and I will go out of my way, get a copy of it, and go through our full review process, including the unboxing video, multiple plays at local events, a written review, and a full podcast segment. Now, this is a backer level I think designers and publishers may want to check out. Option four, personal shopper. Let me know your budget, who you're shopping for, some ideas of what they like, and I will help you find the best games for your gaming dollars. This could be for you, a friend, or family members. Any patrons backing at this level also get all of the hotel guest and tips of bellhop rewards, which we've covered over the past few weeks, and we're not going to repeat them. So head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and let me help you make your gaming experience better than ever. All right, we've been talking about Breakout Con every week. Uh, it's still going on right now. It's coming up quick. No cancellations thus far. So for those of you listening to the podcast, the day it comes out, it hits this weekend. March 20th to the 22nd at the Sheridan Center in downtown Toronto, Ontario. And the entire Tabletop Bellhop team will be there. Now, I do have some exciting news. I am officially running an event now. I am signed up. Uh, I wasn't on schedule earlier today. It's supposed to be up over the next 12 hours. So I don't know what's going to show up. But Friday at noon, I will be running a demo game of Garinto from Grand Gamer Skills. Uh, this is a game we did the preview of. They just had a successful Kickstarter uh, this is going to go noon on Friday. It says four slots, but Mark from Grand Gamers Guild is trying to get me two prototype copies so we can double the space. Now, if I don't, I still think it'd be cool if people wanted to see the game and see how it's played and just stop by. Plus, we have a two-hour time slot, and I might actually be able to fit in two different groups of people. 
No, it's a great game to watch. In addition, we'll have a prototype copy with us all weekend. So if anyone is interested in a pickup game, just let us know. Yeah, hit us up in person. Hit us up on social media. Send me a text. If you want to try out Gorinto sometime at Breakout, let me know and we can work something out. Now, to find out more about BreakoutCon itself, just head to BreakoutCon.com. BreakoutCon, one word, dot com. And as of March 11th in the evening when things are happening, it's <laughs> still going. Canada has not yet hit a level where uh, large groups are being uh, suggested not to uh, join together. Yes. Now, if you do go to BreakoCon, please, please keep track. Do your personal hygiene. I, uh, you know what? I'm terrible. I'll probably still shake hands, but I'm going to make sure I wash my hands as regularly as possible. They have promised to have wipes, alcohol wipes, and um, the cleaning stuff. I can't think hand of what it's called right now. Hand sanitizer available for everyone at the con. We got to make sure we keep it breakout con and not outbreak con. A review of Gold West from Tasty Minstrel Games. All right, first, in an uh, effort to be as transparent a pos as possible, I did receive a review copy of Gold West from TMG at Origins 2019. No other compensation was provided. Now, Gold West was designed by J. Alex Cavern, or Kevern, I'm not sure about that, I apologize, and features art by Adam P. McCliver. It was published in 2015 by Tasty Minstrel Games, plays two to four players in under 60 minutes. See what you get when you pick up a copy of Gold West. Be sure to check out our unboxing video over on YouTube. You'll find a link to that in the show notes. Now, I'm not going to go through everything you get here. If you want that, you can see it on the podcast or you can watch our unboxing video. But I do want to comment on a couple things in regard to component quality in Gold West. Uh, for one, the rule book's great. Nice, big, large text, black font, light background, tons of examples. This is literally one of the better rule books I've seen and read in the last year or so. Now, the player boards, though, are the opposite as cool. They are disappointingly thin, like literally Terraforming Mars level of thin player boards. If you play Terraforming Mars, you know what I'm talking about. These are not boards. These are thick card. And this is another game where you're going to put a lot of stuff on these boards. And if some of that stuff, especially your resources and your bins gets bumped, that could ruin the game. Now, interestingly, the board and the rest of the tokens and the punch boards are the exact opposite. This game has some of the thickest cardboard I have ever seen seen in a game before it's really impressive the chips used like the the land tiles are very easy to pick up and flip over and manipulate which is a huge bonus so how do we use this thick cardboard how do you play gold west all right so to start off you have to build the board now this is built with a frame and a bunch of hex based tiles that show landscape with a river kind of in the middle on that map are a bunch of four different terrain types, and you're going to put a token on top of each of one face down and then flip up the ones next to the river because those are the ones you're able to use at the beginning. There's eight investment cards and some random endgame scoring tiles that are put out before play, and then some bonus scoring tokens are placed on the main board. Now, each player takes a player board. These are all the same. It has a spot to hold all your settlement and camp markers and a place to hold your influence tokens, and then you're going to put a miner which is a little meeple that represents you on the scoring track, and a wagon on each of three shipping tracks. In a really neat way to determine first player, you shuffle up the 100-point tokens for if you lap the board, and then flip them over, and that determines who's first, and then redistribute the other one so you're going to play in a clockwise order. Those tokens also give you your starting resources. Those get put on these resource bins on a person person's player board. Hopefully you so the game does take a like bit that. of time to set up with all the components, but it's not onerous, and the variety of shapes of pieces is helpful mm -hmm. in that. Uh, now, the player colors are compatible with color blindness. I found an online test that I can now do, mm -hmm. so if I've got a good picture of all the color components, I can nice. run through eight different types of color blindness wow. to see if uh, they are still all differenti differentiable during that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, the even went a step further so that the metals are actual different shaped cylinders, so they each have different sides. So even if you couldn't tell the colors apart, they're tactically different, which is cool. Tactilely, not tactically. They, they feel different. All right, um, so when playing, the actual game. So what you're going to do on your turn is you've got four bins on your player board. They're going to have resources in them. You're going to take everything out of one of the bins, and then, like playing Mancala, you're going to drop off one of the things in your hand in each other bin going up until you get to the top. Then whatever you have left in your hand is what determines what actions you can take, which is a very neat mechanic. 
Now, these actions include using metals. Uh, the metals are used to fill, fulfill investment orders, place influence tokens on Boomtown, which is an endgame scoring part of the board, or move up on the shipping tracks. And there's three different shipping tracks. Now, the investment cards let you trade your metal for points or other things. Boomtown is all endgame scoring. And then the sh three shipping tracks is one for copper, silver, and gold. And it's basically one of those things where you slide up on the track and you're going to get points when you hit certain milestones on it or certain thresholds. Now, after you spend all your medals, you have to expand your territory. This is mandatory. You're going to do this by spending wood and or brick. If you only have one of those, if you only have wood or brick, you're going to build a camp, which is represented by a little triangle. It's cute. If you have both wood and brick, you're going to build a settlement, which is a, a camp on top of a little wooden disc. If you got neither, though, you still have to expand by looting a claim off the board. So when building a camp or settlement, what you're going to do is take one of those resource tiles that are on the board and replace it with your playing piece. You're then going to get the resources that are on the token, which you then have to put in one of your supply bins. Now, this is interesting because the decision of what bin to put your stuff in is a big part of the game because of that Mancala mechanic. And you're going to get points for putting stuff in the later bins, the ones you're not going to be able to pull out of right away. It's only a small amount of points. And the last thing you're going to do is you're going to place the tile you took and put it on your player board under the appropriate terrain type. There's four different ones. If you place the settlement, you actually get to skip a spot. And these are used for an end game area control scoring, area majority scoring. Now, looting happens if you couldn't build a settlement or a camp. And what you do is you're still going to pick a tile. You're still going to get the resources, but you don't get to put it on your board. So you don't get to get that scoring. Plus, your camp piece is placed on the wanted poster. And at the end of the game, the players who are most wanted and second most wanted are going to lose some points. Now, this game is really all about the forward thinking. There's a good number of things to recall. I bet mm. most listeners have already forgotten about half of what Mo just said about what resources does what. Yeah, thankfully, there, there's a pretty good summary at the bottom. Basically, metals get you points and, and wood and stone let you expand out. Now, play just keeps going until you placed all of your camp tokens, after which each player gets one more turn to spend their medals. Now, end game scoring includes all kinds of things. There's majority awards for each of the four terrain types, bonus points for your influence tokens on Boomtown, points for each player's largest contiguous chain of camps and settlements, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of little end game scoring. Now, the player at the most points at the end of the game wins. So, all right, nice I think simple, we're at. Right? Everyone, uh, everyone should be able to get it to their. their table on their own first try right no need for extreme play on this <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if we have played extreme in in, in gold west I, I if we have i haven't noticed it yeah so this was an interesting one i didn't know what to expect with gold west this was not a game i was hyped to try this isn't anything i saw, sought out it was a matter of going to the tasty mints for booth at origins and them offering me a review copy and going i don't own that why not um the other thing, too, is, like, I know I heard nothing about this game. Like, this is not a new game. I think it was 2014, I said. I don't feel like scrolling up. Skype will die before I get there. Um, I hadn't heard much about this game, which is a shame, because I think this is a very solid game. Um, I like heavier games in general, and especially heavier games that play quickly. Now, I wouldn't call this heavy. It's a 2.46 on Board Game Geek, but it's heavier than most games that play under an hour. To me, it hits that sweet spot of uh, it's thinky it's fun i i'm being rewarded for my own player skill it's not overly random and i can play it in a short time slot and not many games hit that that sweet spot to me to me that's a, it's a great sweet spot like this is up there for me with bruges strasbourg and hansa teutonica for those one hour thinky fillers i think we could probably call them because you're getting that experience of playing a, a heavier economic game but in that short time frame yeah, no, it fits into an interesting spot where there are a lot of moving parts and forward thinking and planning, but once you get over that initial hump of, of figuring out what all the mm -hmm. different things you can do, it's really not difficult to play. Yeah, and I have played this literally at all player counts. Uh, I played it two, three, and four, and they play it plays just as well. Like, like there, I, I don't even think there's an optimal. I think it's just as good playing two player, three player, and four. And you don't find that often where a two player game and four player, like the two extremes of the player counts are equally fun. Now, I enjoy this game a lot. Like, I, I, it's not my favorite game, but I like it a lot. Deanna loves it. She is a huge fan of this game. Every time she plays, she's like, oh, that's good. We need to play some more. Now, we have taught a couple of gamers who didn't enjoy it as much as us. So this did happen. And I think the reason for that is mostly tied to the fact that this is an abstract euro. 
like you hear the old west and you think cowboys and shootouts and saloons and poker and this doesn't really feel old west you don't feel like a miner you don't get any like gold rush mindset it's all very mechanical Interestingly, I didn't mind the theme. Now, I may just be getting more used to Euros and their, their theme paint. Um, yeah. But uh, I did really enjoy the Mancala aspect, and it forced a level of planning that I think I sometimes let slide in games, right. whereas this really enforces that forward thinking. Because mm -hmm. if you try to just throw something down, you're done. There's no yeah. point in playing at all. Uh, for me, it was a fun game. It's well thought out. I think it's well designed. Again, it's yes, there is theme paint on a Euro, but yeah. I, I got it. You know, I, yeah. I it, it worked. Um, and if you put it in front of me, I'd play this. But for some reason, there's something about the game where I wouldn't ask to play it again. Right? Huh? I, I absolutely, Fair. you know, hey, you want to play Gold West? Sure. But I would never say, hey, do you want to play Gold West? Yeah. And um, I gotta I, say I think that a lot of that maybe what lines up with your lack of hearing about it. Whereas, you know, it's a good game, but it hasn't connected with everyone. And to be honest, I've gotten that from quite a few people. I, this is one of those games where I've heard a lot of people say, I would happily play that again, but I wouldn't go out and buy it. Which, which is disappointing because I personally really dig it. I think it does something cool and new with Mancala. Every other Mancala game I played does a full circle, right? Like you just keep going around in some way. Yep. This has an end, which is neat. And I really love how, quick it is for a thinky filler for me that's a sweet spot but you know what some players are going to be turned off either by the dry mechanics or the fact that it does require that extra level of thinking and especially if they want a quick game this does not fit our quick and easy game thing we were talking about last week in my opinion if you're looking for a game that gives you the feeling of being on the frontier in the old west this isn't it you're you're not the vibe's not there there's to be honest this could have been anything we could have been terraforming mars easily just give it a red coat of paint. It'd be all good. But if you like abstract strategy games that are quick to learn, offer a ton of replayability, and really dig that, that having to plan ahead, having to have forward thinking, getting rewarded for planning ahead, I think it's worth checking out Gold West. But I honestly do have to say try before you buy. I've had far too many people tell me, I dig it. I'd play it again. It was fun, but I wouldn't want to spend the money on it. So fair enough. For anyone local, I've got a copy. If you want to play mine, I'm not going to be getting rid of it. Well, for a more in-depth look at Gold West, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just two. And now, time for a review of Carcassum, an Alia big box game from Ravensburger. All right, first off, I do have to disclose I did receive a review copy of this game from Ravensburger. No other compensation was provided. Carpe Diem was designed by Steffenfeld, features art by Lalanda Krushka, was published in 2018 by Ravensburger in North America. Uh, it's considered part of the Aaliyah Big Box series of games. Now, this tile laying game plays two to four players in about an hour to an hour and a half, maybe a little longer on your first play. To see what you get when you pick up a copy of Carpe Diem, be sure to check out our unboxing video over on YouTube. You'll find a link to that in the show notes. Now, I'm not going to take the time to list out all the components you get here, but I will say this has an excellent rule book. Uh, one of the things Aaliyah does, this is something Aaliyah does great, and I think it's worth calling them out on because it's so good, is they have a standard format for the rule books where they have the rules on the right hand or in the main text, and they have a sidebar that summarizes these rules. And those are so awesome as a quick refresher before play or just before game night when it's been a while since you played. And it was awesome to see that format. I was also really happy to see resource meeple um, instead of wooden cubes. There's no reason the grapes had to look like grapes. They could have been purple cubes. Uh, and the reason I call this out is Aaliyah and Ravensburger for years were very much that dry Euro, very dry wooden cube components. And it's nice to see that they are spending some more time on the visual appeal of their games. Okay, well, how about you tell us a bit about the gameplay in Carpe Diem? All right, so to set up Carpe Diem, you're going to take a random player board, surround it with ran a random frame. And it's interesting to note that the frames are all different. So you're going to get a random frame and build it. You're going to take a patrician meeple. Um, this is a the note, sorry, I should have, I, I'm terrible at remembering to mention the theme. The theme of this game is you are a Roman patrician who is trying to build up their own personal villa and area of town. Um, there's a reason I don't talk about the theme much in this game, though. So you're going to take your patrician, you're going to put it on an unoccupied spot on this wheel that's on the central board. 
You're going to take a set of scoring objective cards that are laid out on the side of the board. These are strongly based on the number of players. And then you're going to take a scroll, place a scroll. They're banderolas, banderolis. We still haven't figured out how to pronounce this word. Banderoli is, I was, as far as I can tell, it's B-A-N-D-R. Or sorry, B-A-N-D-E-R-R-O-L-E. -E. However, that, no, there's only one R. I got an extra R in there. But uh, you take one of these and, and throw it down on the spot that shows scrolls on your board. So you put a scroll token on every scroll spot on your board. You then fill that central market wheel. Every spot gets four random tiles. They happen to come from the light green set. And then there's a set of spots at the bottom of the board you fill with the dark green set. And these just change what's possible on each tile. Now, Carpe Diem's played over four rounds. Each round, you're going to draft tiles from that central board until it runs out. When you draft a tile, you're going to put it on your personal player board. Once they're all drafted, the round ends. You're going to do a scoring round. Then you're going to put out a bunch more new tiles. At the end of the fourth round, which is the final round, there is some end game scoring. Now, on your turn, it's dead simple. Mechanically, you're going to take your Patrician. You're going to move it one space left or right. And you're going to take a tile from where you ended. You're then going to add that tile to your board. First one has to go over the shovel on your board. From then on, they have to touch. Tiles, of course, have to make sense. They have to be placed so the features match on all sides. So think Carcassonne and pretty much every tile game out there. When you complete a feature on your board, you're going to get something. And if you cover one of those scrolls, you go up on the Banderoli, Banderol track. Now, the features on the tiles are what make the game. There are four different types. There are fields. These are oval, and they give you resources. They can be two to four tiles long, and there are four different types of fields giving four different resources. Then there are buildings. These are always exactly two tiles to complete it. Each building is going to give you some reward. Silver buildings move you up on that track I mentioned. Gold buildings are going to let you trade in your resources for gold, which are wild cards. And brown buildings provide bread. Bread lets you break the rules, like move your guys not adjacent but anywhere on the map. Finally, there are green buildings, which allow you to draft a bonus tile from that bottom roll. Remember when we set up, we put a bunch of buildings at the bottom as well from a different bag of things. They're, they're darker and they're, they're all terminuses. Now features, uh, they don't call them this in the game, but I called them features, but these are single tiles that have special rules where they don't connect to anything. As soon as you put it in your villa, you get points or you get something. There's a bakery that gives you bread, a smith that provides gold and a fountain. Now the fountain gives you a deck of cards. We're gonna draw two cards and keep one. Those are all end game scoring. Finally, there are villas. This represents your house in your little Roman district. These can be of any size, can grow to cover your whole board if you really want. And each tile features a number of chimneys on top, which is something important, both in-game and end-game scoring. So uh, as Dee mentioned in the chat room on this game, this is a very Euro paste it on theme game. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be pretty much anything you wanted it to be, but... Yeah. As an Aaliyah big box, they go with the historical, so it turns out it's going to be, you know, the Roman, the Roman area. Yeah, that's uh, Steffenfeld must like Romans. Like uh, he puts out Trajan for him, Trajanum, uh, Notra, something. Uh, he he does a lot of Roman themed games. He also seems to like German economic games, so like the speakers that. But yeah, this this is probably one of the most pasted on themes I've ever seen in a game. So once you've got your tiles and all of them are gone, you're going to score. And here is part of the killer app of this game. Uh, that banderol track I mentioned is going to determine who goes first. So being first on that's big because you're going to get to score first. And what you're going to do is there's a grid of scoring cards, and you're going to put a token between two of them saying, I'm going to score those two things. And once someone's chosen that, for the rest of the game, that spot's done. Those two cards have been scored because of where it's placed. Now, these scoring cards, there is no way I can recap even close to all of them, but there's going to be all kinds of things based on what you have on your board. So you're going to get points for resources you trade in or for having certain building types or for having three different types of fields or for having all the same fields or for having how many chimneys you have on your villa and so on. There are a ridiculous, the deck of scoring cards is, is significant, we'll just say. And what's neat is they're distributed, so there's always going to be some two cards that score villas, and there's always going to be something that needs resources, and there's always going to be something that needs fields. Now, at the final round, in addition to choosing those objective cards, 
There is some end-game scoring. Anything you have left over you didn't spend, you're going to get points for. How far you're up on that Bander Roll track, you're going to get points for. There's those fountain cards I mentioned earlier that are end-game scoring. You're going to get points for those. And then finally, you're going to count up your chimneys on your completed villas and get massive points if you have a high number of those. I think you're aiming for like 18 by the end of the game for the max points. So along with his Roman theme, much like Caesar, he likes his point salad. Yeah. <laughs> much like Caesar. Yes. It's a Steffenfeld game. It's a point salad. Who knew? Um, there is obviously a bit more to that. Bread can be used to move anywhere. Gold's a wild resource and so on. But you know what? That's enough to give uh, a pretty good gist of how Carpe Diem plays out without seeing it in front of you. Well, I, we know that you are a fan of Feld. So I think we can yeah. guess where this review is going. But let's hear yeah. it. Yeah, it's true. I Like, at this point, I haven't found a Feld I didn't like, and Carpe Diem's not the first to break that rule. I, I dig it. This is a great game. This is a fantastic Kyle Lane point salad. And what really has impressed me about this game isn't my reaction to it. It's other people's. I've yet to teach this to someone and have them not like it. The one that's really surprised me is this has won over a few of my non-Euro-loving fans. Like, there is a local gamer, I'm not going to call out by name, because he made take this as derogatory and i don't mean it this way but they like quick light games like one of their favorite games that's come out recently is tiny towns and that's about at their level of wanting to plan ahead and think yet they love this and i don't want to really point out and go you realize you like a heavier euro like it just i, I feel like they they'd be like oh wait no i don't like that game anymore right like I, I, this has totally won over some gamers i never thought would enjoy a stephen felt like they tend to avoid any game that causes brain burn because to them playing games isn't about thinking it's about having fun, right? Yet, here they are, loving it. Now, I will admit, the game isn't perfect. Uh, the artwork, to me, is boring and drab, and some of the tiles and colors are really hard to tell apart from a distance. Specifically, the, the brown chicken farms and the brown buildings, until you're standing right on top. Now, they did try to do something where the fields are round and the buildings are square, but uh, it's, it's rough. Like, everything just needs to pop more. They need to up the... Contrast isn't the right word. The intensity of, of everything and just make it pop more, especially when you're trying to see other players' boards. And as Sean mentioned, and I'll say, this is one of the most pasted on themes I've ever seen. Like this could be so easily, not only just re-themed, but like re-themed to almost anything. Like it's just, I don't know. It, it, it's it's terrible for that. But to be honest, none of this, the, 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 the drab look or the paste on theme does not affect the gameplay. And it's the gameplay that I love. And I am always looking for something new in a game. And the 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 kicker to me in this game, despite just being a really solid tile laying game, is that scoring system. I love how variable it is. It's the fact you use a small subset of the entire deck of cards each game means every game's gonna play different. And I don't know what the possible combinations are, but it beats um Imhotep's 1028 by far. Uh, what objectives cards come out is going to totally change the way players play and how they're going to build their territories. So now I know you're going to, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but we, when you look at tile lane games, so let's so say king, king and queen domino, right? Those are kind yep. of a, a good average level. Most people can get, a, can get their, can dig their teeth into king and queen domino. Is this a next level? Is this something that if you really love those, you know, your king and queen domino, you should look towards uh, Carpe Diem, or is this still a little bit too far of a step? No, I think you nailed it there. This is what I think I, I like the most about this. This is a heavier tile laying game. Tile laying games, for whatever reason, tend to be easier, simpler, easier to learn, quicker to play. And this is. This is a step up from King Domino, Isle of Sky, Carcassonne, any of those games. And I think if you're a fan of those games and you're looking for more of the same, no. But if you are looking for that step up, that additional challenge that I want a game where my, my planning ahead is really re rewarded. You can't plan ahead in Kark. Well, okay, I'm going to eventually close in this city. Like, yeah, I'm going to build this long road because I know eventually I'm going to draw another road. That's not the same level of strategy you're going to find in a game like this. This is more about I'm going to try to score that scoring card and that scoring card or this one, but I know other people are playing, so I'm going to have a backup plan to possibly get this one or that one. You don't have that level of strategic play in any of those games, Isle of Sky, King Domino, Queen Domino, Carcassonne, whereas that's what this tosses into that mix. Is I, I, Many of those games are tactical, where you have to re, um, change your, your play based on what happened right then, 
Whereas this does have tactical elements, especially if someone takes that damn tile you wanted before you get to it. That's definitely part of the game. But it really rewards strategic play, that long-term thinking. Now, the one that still surprises me is the fact that this one has proven to be popular with gamers who love heavy, meaty stuff like Deanna and gamers who like like quicker games. And that, I think, is one of the neat things to see. At this point, I think if you are a Feld fan, just pick up this game. Like, if you like Feld, you're going to dig this. It's a point salad. It's got the Roman theme, if that's your thing. Uh, if you like Kart or other tile laying games and you're looking for a next step, grab it. For everyone else, give it a shot. Uh, try to find a copy, find a store, do a demo. Ask me to bring it out if you happen to know me. I think there's a lot here to enjoy for gamers of almost all experience levels. Now, I would not throw this in as a gateway. This is not something I would throw in as your first game. But as long as you played a couple tile games, if you've got that concept of drafting, I think this is worth checking out. Well, for a more in-depth look at Carpe Diem, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com just on reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and see summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our table. Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Now, this past week, didn't have any public play gaming events that I was part of, so uh, first we talked about playing two-player games, Deanna and I, but then we did some work on our pile of shame and then looking at our pile of obligation, decided, you know what, we really got to get some of these games from Origins and stuff that people had shipped in and played. So we decided to get a hold of a couple local gamers, Jeff and Sheila Seuss, and had them over to play a few four-player games. Up first was a game of Gold West. That went really well. Um, Jeff was in the chat earlier tonight while we were reviewing Gold West, going on about how much he enjoyed it and how much his wife actually really liked it. Uh, both of them picked up the game really well. And, man, it was a nice close fight to the end. I had no idea who was going to win. I liked seeing both Jeff and Sheila pick up the mechanics pretty quickly, and they both noted they enjoyed it by the end of the play. Uh, Jeff noted he really liked the Moncala mechanic, and Sheila just seemed to enjoy the game overall. Now, as I mentioned in the review, Jeff was one of the people who said, I will happily play this again, anytime, break it out. But it's not the kind of game he would pick up. Part of that also being that it wouldn't be as good with his regular group because his regular group's into more thematic games. Up next, I broke out Carpe Diem, a uh, Stefan Feld tiling game we just finished talking about. Now, despite having a longer, more complicated teach, this went over even better than Gold West, in my opinion. Um, I think everyone enjoyed it. Both Jeff and Sheila expressed an interest in playing again the next time we get together. Um, now, some of this, I do think, is due to the fact that I think to really enjoy Carpe Diem, you do have to play it twice because it has a fairly unique scoring system. And you're going to have fun that first game. And that's the impressive part is that even if you don't do well and you don't quite get it, it's one of those games where you're going to know what you did wrong and want to try again and want to try harder. So uh, they both really wanted to play that one again. I love I love games like that. I've said it a few times on uh, on the show that there, you know every once in a while you just play that game and you're like, oh wow, I did horrible, but I know that I did horrible. Mm -hmm. I understand what I wasn't getting. I figured yeah. out this game now, and I want to play it again, and I'll feel like I'm able to play the game. Yeah, better the site. And I, I think Carpe Diem uh, we probably should have mentioned it in a review. I think that is a, it has that aspect to it. That, that I oh, I know what I did wrong. I know what I'd do different next time. I'm looking forward to trying again. Once again, Feld for the win. So now we did consider playing another Carpe Diem. Silly us. We went, oh, that's going to take too long. Let's pick something shorter. But then sat in a room filled with hundreds of games. And our guests were kind of like, well, I look at all the games. Man, they've got to have something I want to play, right? Like with all the options. So I put the pile of obligation aside. Say, hey, it's up to you guys, whatever you want to play. Um, that did take some time. To, to decide on what we we're going to do. Amusingly, one of the things we tried is rolling a D26 to roll up a letter of the alphabet. Came up with J, and at the time, I could not find a J game in my collection. I'm like, I must have one. I did find one afterwards, but it wasn't four-player. But eventually, Jeff noticed I had Istanbul, which is a game he's always been curious about. So we broke that one out. Now, this is a classic. Again, the new hotness from 2014, right? Um, this one has sat on my shelf of shame unplayed for a long time. Um, I remember loving it when it came out, but I had pretty much totally forgotten how to play. Um, one of the things that surprised me when I opened it was, oh, I have an expansion, so <laughs> totally forgot about that. 
Thankfully, it's not an overly complicated game to learn or teach, so it took me a bit to sort out what was from the base game and what was from the expansion and review the rules, which does lead me to the pro tip of the night. If you have an expansion that's the kind you take in and out of a game, put them in separate baggies, because it took me a bit to figure out what was what. That's something I wish Pastmo had done, was bag things better. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we can give notes to future Mo, but not to <laughs> past Mo. Yeah, uh, and of course, when I put it away, no, when I put it away, I did. I kept all the expansions separate. Uh, Istanbul is one of those games where it was like riding a bike. Once we started playing, everything came back to me. Uh, it's a really neat game that does, again, I like games that do something neat. And the neat mechanic here is that it's a worker placement game where you basically have a pile of workers. You have a stack of assistants with a merchant on top, and you're going to move it around the board, and wherever you get to a spot, you either have to drop off an assistant to do the action, or you have to pick up one of your assistants that's already there. And eventually, you're going to run out of assistants, so this leads to interesting decisions where your planning usually means you need to find a way to use each spot twice so that you're going to get use of it when you dropped off your assistant and use when you picked it up. And failure to do so is generally not a good thing like you're not playing well if you end up you're like oh i had to waste a turn to go get an assistant right. so one of the things happened on saturday was that playing istanbul reminded me just how good the game actually is and why i have it in my collection because i gotta admit when jeff said istanbul i was like huh istanbul i haven't played that in a long time i've been currently trying to purge my collection a bit make room for new games as well as make some money to put back into the gaming budget and i was actually wondering like hmm i haven't played istanbul in so long is it time to get rid of it and I gotta say, no, it's it's definitely staying in my collection. It was fun playing it again. That neat worker placement mechanic still feels fresh. Uh, it's just as good now as I remember it being back when we first started playing it. So that was cool to know. I'm still gonna keep Istanbul. Next time, maybe we'll try the expansion that's in there. Um, so that was it for our game night with Jeff and Sheila. Uh, that's something I hope will become more of a regular thing in the coming months. Uh, they are local. They have some free nights. They've talked about getting together there a little more often. So that might be something we plan to do when there aren't local events going on. But I look forward to playing more games with them. We had a great time on Saturday night. Now, the other thing that happened this past week is Deanna and I took a few days off, um, days off from work, the kids and my mom. We spent Sunday to Tuesday out in Kingsville, Ontario, staying at Inn 31, enjoying some good food, good beer, as well as a few two-player games. Not as many as I originally thought, but we took the time to relax and slept a lot, so can't really complain about that. Now, of all the games that we started with, and this is because we went to a brew pub uh, after dinner, and they had games on the table, uh, we played checkers. We went to the Banded Goose Brewery, and one of the things they have is every table had a different game at it. One table had Yahtzee, one had Snakes and Ladders, uh, one probably had chess. They all had um, the boards were like stickers that were on the tables. It was kind of well done. We happened to sit down at a checkers table and played a couple games. Well, at least you did it after you figured out how to lay out your board. Well, yeah, yeah, I deleted that tweet after I googled <laughs> the rules because I, I, for both of us, we're like, I'm pretty sure you put. Um, we we played more chess than checkers. Uh, what was most interesting here is that Deanna had never played with the rule that if you can capture a piece, you have to which, to my knowledge, has always been one of the, the main rules, um, which, again, kind of goes back to our main topic, where a lot of people avoid this one, because this seems to be one of the most popular house rules in checkers to make the game less cutthroat is you don't have to capture. To me, checkers is okay without this rule. Like, eh, it's, it's, it's playable. But to me, it's a real game once you throw in that whole you have to jump. Now there's real tactics and strategy. And if you haven't tried checkers with that rule, I do recommend trying it. It might be a better game than you remember. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I know on, uh, I used to have a checkers game on my phone that I'd play with my son when we were out uh, at different events. Uh, and it was definitely a specific checkbox whether or not yeah. it required that. Now, checkers or draft to our friends elsewhere is one of those games that's been codified slowly <laughs> over centuries. Uh, and each official guide seems to have slight variations in the wording and descriptions. And the actual official sport checker rules, the American standard, uh, get do get adapted and adjusted now and then. Uh, my personal problem with checkers, at least the 64 square variant, so the 8x8, is that it's solved. Mm. Uh, in 2007, uh, Canadian uh, computer scientist Jonathan Schaefer uh, Proved that the game, when played perfectly, ends in a draw. 
So essentially, oh, it's a more complex version of tic tac toe. I don't know if if you don't know how to play perfectly, it's the same reason that people who say that you know, there's a proper way to pour Puerto Rico. As long as you don't know that proper way, we had some fun with it. It was all right. It, it wasn't great. It wasn't the best game we played, but you know what? It was good to to play over some beers. So the next game we played, uh, this wasn't the same day, but actually ended up being the same venue. We spent a lot of time at that brewery. Um, we played a couple rounds of Jambo. Uh, I made the talked about earlier about not being able to find a J game in my collection. Well, I found this one. Um, this is one of the older games in the Cosmos two-player series of games. There are a ton of these. This goes all the way back to 2004. It's a two-player card game, card-driven game, um, set collection game where you're playing competing Swahili market stalls in Africa. Uh, you're going to use cards to put wares into your market stalls and then later use other cards to try to sell them. Along with that, there are a bunch of utility cards that break the rules in some way, and then these people and animal cards that basically let you influence and manipulate your opponent's market stand. And what all this boils down to is a ridiculously cutthroat two-player game that is almost all take that mechanisms, fighting against luck of the draw, getting the, the right things. That's right. A couple takes a vacation to play cutthroat competitive games that would likely turn down <laughs> many relationships. Yeah, this is this is one um, we did not mention this game in our uh, any of our two player game recommendation episodes, and there's a reason for that. For one, it didn't fit last week. It is not quick and easy. Um, to me, it doesn't fit there. We found our games going up to the one hour mark, and it's a bit of a pain to learn at first because you don't know the cards. This is yet again like the, our first play felt so different from our second play, just by knowing what cards are in the deck. If you don't have that foreknowledge, you're not really enjoying it. And you're just going to get better knowing once you start playing even more often and knowing there's three alligators and two guards, it's going to change how you play. Now, maybe if you play 10 times, this would be quick and easy for you, but not for new players. Um, now, we also have a good article about date night games. And as we just talked about, this is very much a take the game, not something I'm going to recommend on for date night for the average group. Um, we definitely felt the uh, the frustration of the tape deck mechanism. We'll put it that way. Now, if we ever do a good two-player games that are somewhat thinky, uh, we might see Jumbo on this list. Or perhaps players' uh, games that can end or strengthen your approach. There you go. There's our new topic is here. Games that will make you either fall in love or hate each other. So, yeah, Jumbo was interesting. Um, I, to be honest, we really enjoyed the first play, and the second play wasn't as good. But part of the first play was the discovery of, ooh, look what the new card is. And when that was gone, it, it actually was a little less enjoyable. So I, I think I know why this has sat on my shelf for a long time. It definitely wasn't terrible, but I'm not going to rush out. So this isn't going to replace the Duke or Patchwork or anything like that for us. Now, the final game that saw some play while we were out of town was Seven Wonders Duel. Now, this one has been on, I think, every two-player game recommendation list we've done except co-op games. And the only reason it's not on there is it's not co-op. And I still strongly stand behind putting it up on every list and probably every list we're going to do forward. This is a fantastic two-player game. Now, what was interesting about this last series of plays is that Deanna actually didn't enjoy the game the first time she played it. Now, this is a long time ago. And at that time... Um, she's never been a fan of Seven Wonders, but it was a game that everyone was playing every time we went out to a local event. So she was very much burnt out on Seven Wonders, and I don't think gave Duel a chance. She spent most of the game going, yeah, this is okay, but it's Seven Wonders. I'm happy to say I think I've changed her mind on this one after this, la I keep wanting to say weekend, but technically it was the start of the week. After this getaway, because uh, after two plays, she was completely sold. She's like, can we please play that again? This is now one we're going to pack along with Patchwork and the Duke as a regular two-player experience for us. Uh, if you play two-player games and don't own Seven Wonders Duel, just go pick it up. Like this, I can't think of anyone who's going to hate this. Game. There we go. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Ah, uh, well, this coming Saturday is a CG Realm game night. Uh, Ian is going to be showing off Stellar. This is a hot astronomy game from Renegade Games, a 2020 release, so something, they, you're talking new hotness here. Um, I do look forward to checking that out. I'll try that out. Uh, it's a nice, light, quick game, as you expect from, from Ian showing them off. Um, I myself, though, will be trying to bring some more Pile of Obligation games. One of the ones I know people dig, so if you're going to be there this weekend, I, I need to get Tyrants of the Underdark. I need one more play. 
I've definitely played it enough, but it's been too long, and I just need a quick refresher before I rate up the review. So that's one I you anyone listening, you'll be able to hear probably a Tyrants of the Underdark review next Wednesday. All right, well, we've got March break ahead, and uh, as well as that, I need to jump into Sketch and see what all has changed in the world of Breakout Con in preparation for all of us being there together again. Wash your hands, yes. folks, and if you have symptoms, stay home and reach out to the con for a refund. Just uh, most things that are canceling or that aren't canceling are giving that option available. Yeah, because that is what is going on the week after that. We will all be at Breakout Con the 19th through the 22nd. 20th I think we go home. 22nd is the 20th. Official right, okay. Con, yeah. yeah, we'll be in town the 19th through the 23rd, I think, is Tiana and I, right? We're going home Monday. All righty. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP groups. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Jeff Seuss was great gaming with you and Sheila Saturday. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly, thank you, Sean. And Andrew Dacey, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. I feel like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTubes at 2 a.m. every Wednesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. To those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.